Hi, everyone. This is Mary Beth with Day One Life Coaching, and I am here with Roy Owens. Uh, Roy Owens is the founder of Heroes Hypnotherapy, and he specializes in helping people with trauma, anxiety, depression, so PTSD, phobias, addiction, smoking, weight loss, you name it. So if you're interested, I'm going to put some links in the bottom. If that sounds something like something that would interest you, Roy actually lives in the UK. And um, he does everything by Zoom. And his first consultation is absolutely free. So if you decide to work with them, you guys can schedule that and figure out a schedule later. But you can find him at heroeshypnotherapy.com. And heroes is H-E-R-O-E-S. I didn't want to forget to say that in case you can't stay tuned till the end. So Roy, Roy is here um, actually to tell us his personal journey and how he got into um, how he decided to become a coach, become a hypnotherapist. And he has a personal story of his a journey from addiction to becoming his own personal hero, basically. And I've known Roy for about three years, we think, yep. he decided. Yep. Met him on Facebook. And we think it's absolutely fabulous that um, Facebook can be used for um, positive things as well. It has kind of a bad reputation, but... How cool is it that we're able to sit here and chat like this and you get to tell your personal story helps so many people uh, with your with your journey? I think it's awesome. Yeah, definitely. And, and you know, um, I'm quite happy to share my story freely. I've only got one story. Um, and um, I mean, we talked didn't we, about uh, when I share an AA meeting, you know, what, what do what, what do I say? And, and, I, and, I, and I don't plan. I don't rehearse certainly not these days. I just ask the universe to give me the words and, and whatever comes out, comes out. You channel. Uh, um, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. It's a, a lovely phrase. I've never heard that before, but yeah, that's exactly what we do. Yeah. And, um, and of course, then, if it's not scripted and it's not rehearsed, it's honest, it's from the heart, and yeah. it's what happened or it's how I feel. Because sometimes, you know, you get good days, you get bad days. Just share with honesty and tell people how it is that day. Well, I am so thankful that you volunteered to be on this. Tell me your story. I, I really do appreciate that. And I know your story is going to help a lot of people because I, I already know your story and I would love um, nothing more than for you to volunteer. And I do appreciate you so much. So um, I guess do you want. So by the way, guys, Roy is going to mainly start at the beginning of his addiction to alcohol. Is, is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. 2011 is when you you've been sober since 2011, correct? Yes. Yeah, since uh, 14th of May 2011 was my the last day I drank. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. And what a day. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that that day is um, it's sort of etched on my mind. And, um, you know, this um, this phrase we have in AA, if you can't remember your last drink, you might not have had it. <laughs> and and I, I can remember that day vividly, right from the, the early hours of the morning when I woke up, um, all the way through to the way things unfolded during the day. And um, it's particularly significant. I can remember, not obviously each and every drink, but I can remember the whole day and I can remember really significant parts of it. And it, it sort of, it started around about, I would think, 3, 3.30 in the morning, waking up with really severe withdrawals from the previous days, drinking and the previous days and the previous days. And so it goes on. I'm um, familiar. It's, we call it I, uh, in the States, anxiety. It's a hangover that anxiety. And if I can just go, go into the chemistry of why that happens, the scientific reason yeah. is because um, I'm an addiction recovery coach for anyone who you know doesn't know me and just happened to come upon my video. So I'm addiction recovery coach, a law of attraction coach, and with law of attraction, I, we work with all subjects, but regarding addiction recovery, I did have to quit drinking alcohol myself because it was just no longer serving me and it was disturbing my sleep heavily. And that was like the main thing for me. If, if, if you can't sleep, your whole next day is ruined. It affects everything you do. I need to be on top of my game. I couldn't, I couldn't handle that. And I also am very aware how important it is to feel good. Um, you know, with the law of attraction, you have to vibe high or else you're affecting your future, literally mm -hmm. 
literally. So with um, the anxiety, what's going on uh, chemically is that your body will, it's doing its job to create stimulants when you, when you add the depressant, which is alcohol, alcohol is a depressant. So your body is doing what it's supposed to do by creating a bunch of stimulants. But when that depressant wears off, which is usually about five, four or five hours after your last drink, right. um, it's usually about three in the morning for a lot of people <laughs> when the depressant wears off and all you're left with is all of those stimulants that, that your body created to prepare and the reason moderation quits working is because if you, you, you might've only had one or two drinks this time, but maybe a couple of nights ago or the night before you had two bottles of wine. Well, your body starts to, you know, prepare for what your usual is on your first drink. So moderation's out the window, guys, it stops working. Eventually you might be able to, I was able to get away with it for a long time, you know, up into my or early forties, probably. And I'm 47 now. And I just could no longer handle that cycle of, you know, the up and down and it, the trade-off became not worth it. I mean, and I know for, for you, you had more of a severe, uh, you, and that's what I'm going to ask with my next question is going to be like, how much did you drink? Because there's a, there's a big spectrum of, of addiction, you know, some, I think someone, if it's affecting their life negatively, if they're only having two drinks, that's an addiction. You know, if they have two drinks yeah. a day and it starts to affect them, if it affects you in a negative way and you're not able to control it, that's an addiction. Um, but then there's, you know, then there's a severe addiction. Like I believe it, you would agree. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> your story. I, so you were severely addicted, Roy. <laughs> I, you know, that's a hands up to that one. Absolutely. Um, I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, heavy drinking was was sort of it, it, here in the UK, going out with the with, with friends, and, and not just the weekend after work. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I started um, working with my dad. Um, my dad's philosophy was a man works hard, he's entitled to a drink on the way home. And that's what we did. But of course, that was never enough. It was I think the, the, the phrase I used, I, you know, I was born two drinks short because as a child, before alcohol entered my life, I was quite an anxious, nervous child. Mm -hmm. And because alcohol came along and suddenly that hole that, that was there was suddenly filled with the alcohol, the confidence, the ability to be comfortable in social settings, whatever it might be. Alcohol was quite a powerful tool in the early days. But, I'm know, so glad you brought that up because that is the number one reason people drink. Uh, well, there's more than one reason, but so the two top would be a social lubricant to ease social anxiety. Otherwise, why are people doing it? Relief. They, um, it might be relief from trauma, but you know, Hey, an alternative is go to hypnotherapy, you know, because trauma is something that can only be covered up by alcohol. Something like hypnotherapy, that's a way to actually get to the root of the problem, stop suppressing and covering up your feelings with the Band-Aid that's alcohol that only makes it worse, and do something that's actually going to help with that trauma, help with the anxiety. And it's totally natural to seek relief, right? We're not yeah. saying like, you're, do you're, you're doing what you need to do in the moment, to feel better and that's that's natural so nobody's saying this is bad wrong decision you know i made that decision a lot more times than i'd like to admit to find relief from anxiety or relief from drinking too much the day before the hair and, and that's it isn't it the, the, the drinking itself the alcohol in your system it starts to, as you withdraw i mean particularly with large amounts of alcohol that withdrawal creates an anxiety yes. and of course yeah. The one thing that I knew was that when I got into that anxiety, that, that the shakes, call it what you will, dry, dry heaving, wanting to be sick, even then my body wanted alcohol. I knew that if I could get alcohol into my system, all of those physical responses would have been quelled by more alcohol. Yes. But my mind, my mind never ever wound the film back to the point where the alcohol actually caused the symptoms I'm now trying to alleviate by giving it more alcohol. Well, it's a vicious cycle. It's, it's, it's really hard to get out of because it is the, <laughs> the problem is also the solution. 
And yep. yeah, it's just really hard to get out of that because you're just thinking of how do I, I need to feel better right now. I need this to stop right now. And, you know, I'm going to tell a story about like one of my most embarrassing alcohol mornings. Um, so I overdid it and I was really mad at myself because I had to work the next day and I was feeling all the, sh all the shame, all the guilt. And you guys, that's so bad. That's so bad for us to have all that shame and that guilt, you know, and I didn't want to feel it. I wanted relief from that. I was feeling physically sick, of course, but, um, I didn't drink as much to where I got the shakes. Like, like you did, I just got, but I got anxiety because I was so mad at myself for mm -hmm. here I am again. Oh my God. I promised myself. I broke a promise to myself. And that's a horrible feeling. Right. And I went to the supermarket, you know, about 8 AM, probably before eight, whenever they opened, I don't remember when it was, but I just needed some relief. I knew I could not get through my day the way I felt and I need to be on top of my game. Right. So this is probably like four years ago. And, you know, I'm, I'm going on three years of no alcohol. So, but this, so this was obviously before I made that decision yeah. and I went in and I bought some red wine that early in the morning, just that's, that was my thing. That's all I really wanted. I wasn't really interested in other alcohol. So it was like I was, my, I had a very specific vice of red wine. And I, so I had to get my red wine. I go in there and I bought a gift bag with it because I was so embarrassed and humiliated, ashamed, all the things. And I just wanted it to appear. And I even told a stupid story. You know how you do, oh, it's going to this uh, party tonight, you know, and got to be prepared. <laughs> and I, I'm sure I looked like hell. I probably smelled like alcohol, you know, but I, you're, we're not fooling anybody. We're not. No, absolutely not. Imagine how, many, imagine how many times that uh, cashier had heard those stories from people like us. Right. Right. I mean, I know because I've it, said it loads of rampant. times. It's rampant. And like you were saying about UK and your dad, um, and that's just what you did. It's so socially acceptable that it's hard to tell when it crosses over into a problem because everybody's doing it. Hey, you know, yeah. you guys, you quit smoking cigarettes. Everyone's proud of you. You quit drinking. You're a pussy. You're a wimp. You know, yeah. all these things. And what's wrong with you? Come on. You're no fun. You're no fun. But, you know, um, with practice, we can become fun again. It is hard in the beginning, though, isn't it, when you first quit? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think for me, um, the pain was so great of that last day. Um, I, I reached a point where um, I, uh, my day started, as I said, probably about three, half three in the morning. I got to the supermarket. I bought this case of cider, strong cider, and I made it to just outside the store. And I remember I was like some kind of ravenous animal ripping this the, the carton apart just to get in. Give me that, PTSD. You're giving me PTSD. <laughs> and that, that, that third can of, of cider as it went in and just the, the nerves crawling down and that. The oh, warmth, the going oh, through the system. <laughs> it, was, it was just a relief that I wasn't shaking and quaking and, and, and everything sort of calmed down. But... I was this sorry figure, and 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 it really was. I was holding this this case of of cider, yeah. and, I, and I remember it was it was dark, it was raining, but that didn't matter. I just wanted to get back to the apartment, drink some more of this stuff, and then climb back onto the sofa and hopefully go back to sleep. And and I, and I I drank all of those, all twelve cans, um, and then I got up and I'd gone to the pub at lunchtime, and then I'd gone from the pub. To the supermarket and bought another case and i'd woken up i don't know whether it was six seven eight o'clock it was dark and i remember and instantly i wanted a drink i was withdrawing yeah stood up by the phone and i had my wallet at the left of the phone it's, it's quite it's sort of really etched on my mind and i can remember picking the wallet up looking for some cash credit card or whatever it might be yeah and i had this I was going to say a thought. It's not a thought because a thought comes in the head from within, just within me. There, there was this voice that I can't do this anymore. Yeah. I really can't do this anymore. And I put the wallet down. I picked the phone up and I called for an ambulance. I dialed 999 as we, we do here. And the ambulance crew turned up, took one look at me and took me into the hospital. Mm -hmm. Now, the power of alcoholism within me was such that whilst I'd I was waiting to be admitted inside the hospital. I was inside secure electric doors. Um, and a, and a, a member of the ambulance crew 
came in from outside and the doors opened and my head was just telling me I shouldn't be there. I was only a drunk. I wasn't sick. I wasn't like these people that needed help. And I was out of the door and gone. And I, and I walked home. Wow. And I was planning on getting home, get my wallet, go to the pub. And when I got home, there were two police cars outside my address. I've been reported as a vulnerable missing person. Um, they were so concerned. And I remember this young police officer sitting down with me in the apartment and he said, I can't force you to go, but please go back. You, you need help. And it was just like the fight had gone. I just said, yeah. And, it, and, and he, I sat next to him in the police car. He took me back to the hospital. And the next 10 days were sort of very hazy. They gave me all kinds of concoctions of drugs to wean me off the alcohol. And I can you were remember- were in that hospital for 10 full days? Yep. Oh, wow. And, um, and then as, as sort of, um, it was almost like the fight had been removed because previous days in hospital, and I had been, I was just constantly fighting to get out. Don't need to be here. I don't need this. I'll be fine now. Yeah. And of course, I, I, this time, I, I just given up. This time, I mean it, or you know, like, but but you uh, knew this time. This time, uh, you were serious. Just knew. I, I knew the, the only thing I, I can describe it as. I surrendered that evening. I went into the hospital, loads and loads of Librium or whatever it was, and I went through this controlled detox. Came out the other side. And, and I was very, very fortunate to, to get funding to go to a treatment center, Cloud House, down in Wiltshire. And, and I, I went there sober. I almost ran there. I was so anxious to get in. So, and, and, and I got in there and if, whatever they asked me to do, I did. Um, we went through the, through the program. And my life has not been a bed of roses in that time. I mean, you know, I've, I've lost my parents in, in that time. And, and lots of other things have happened, but at no time, and, and I can put my hand on my heart and say this, at no time did I feel the need to pick up a drink for anything that's happened in my life. And, and that is truly amazing because this man poured so much alcohol down his neck over the years that had gone by um, that to get to that point was just truly phenomenal. And it wasn't my doing. I, I believe very much in a higher power in the universe. I'm not a religious man. Absolutely. But I do believe that there is a power out there and that power um, maybe saw, saw fit to, to, to grace me with some kind of recovery because it's that the, the desire to drink has one day at a time never, ever returned. That is awesome. And I believe that as well. And all we have to do is, is you know, just ask for help, you know, just, just ask and and we are given that grace, right? And I tell me if you agree with this, but what, for me, when I just knew I was done, I would say I was sick and tired of feeling sick and tired. That's how I describe it. Yeah. Um, but I felt an actual, um, cause I had several times, but I'm never again, I'm never drinking again. I'm done with it, you know, la la la. And then I would, um, when I do feel better, it's easy to kind of forget. Oh yeah, yeah. So, you know, this time when I said it, when the day that I knew I was done, it was a personality shift. I knew that I knew that I knew that I knew that I was never going to open that window again. I didn't go the AA route. I had been studying law of attraction since like 2006. So I, I knew what I was doing to myself. I knew my life was never going to improve. I was always every day holding myself back from living my best life. So I knew too much to continue to do that shit. You know what I'm saying? I just knew too much. Um, I could no longer take it. I knew that there was no way that I was, do, do I ever feel a little bit of temptation though? I think that I do, but I know I would never act on it. Right. And a little trick that I use, is very important um, for me to tell anyone who might be listening and might be sober curious or, you know, you, giving into temptation, even though you promised yourself, which is a horrible feeling. Um, FAB, fading effect bias. What you do because there's a fading effect bias. That means you tend to only remember the good things about alcohol. We do this with relationships as well. You know, toxic relationships. We think of, oh, that was actually pretty, oh, I start to miss them. And you get kind of a little bit nostalgic and how great yeah. it was forgetting that it was hell for the most part, right? 95% hell. We're going to remember the 5%. We, we call it. That was my best friend. Alcohol was my best friend. So, so what you do because of this fading effect bias, 
you want to focus on your worst night. You want to always go straight there. Do not entertain the bullshit. Sorry for my language, but I'm very passionate about this topic. Don't entertain those thoughts that it's going to be different this time because it's not. I'm sorry. You yeah. might be able to moderate for a while. And that was my thing, moderation. Like I, I could abstain, but as soon as I have, and I know that, I know that maybe I'll, do, you know, if I ever did it again, it would turn right back. I'd be right back at square one, day one, square one. So um, anyway, that's a little tip that, that always think about your worst night. Don't let your mind trick you into thinking it's going to be different this time because it's only te temporarily. I could sometimes go 20 times, moderate. 20 times, the 21st time, I'm going to get, you know, hammered and yep. then, and then that starts a whole new cycle. And then it's like, you know, like I never quit to begin with the moderation yep. is out the window. We, we sort of use the phrase instead of the, the FAB euphoric recall. Oh, or we remember, as you say, are the really good parts. Yeah. What really could be again, okay, excuse the language, but a what shitty you time. Euphoric, euphoric recall. Euphoric recall. So we I've just remember. I like it. Remember those real highs, the really wonderful times. But yeah. that, as you say, five percent. And and the other thing, I, I, um, and I, I say it to quite a lot to, to clients is when they're talking about when when I crave a drink, and I say wind the film forward, an hour, two hours, or to Think tomorrow. About the next day, the and, next morning, visualize, shake the film like crap. They, yeah, based on what's happened previously, you wind that film forward, where's it going to be? Mm -hmm. It's going to be in the horrible place that you were last night and the night before and the night before that, because we know it's not going to be any different. And I mean, for me, I'd given up. I, I was what we call a dry drunk here. I was, um, I had no alcohol in my body for five years, but my behavior was off the wall because I didn't look at me. I didn't look. Um, I didn't do any work on myself whatsoever. Oh. I had no faith in a higher power. I just was white knuckling in on lots of days. And the difference is is immense between that time when I was five years dry and now when I consider myself to be 11 years sober. Being sober is a hugely different situation than being dry. Very, dry, very I interesting. Given, I would have given anything in those five years to have found a reason to drink. Wow. And eventually I did. Eventually I did. Somebody once said to me, if you want to test your sobriety, throw a relationship in. And that's what I did. And that's where it took me. Um, so, you know, but <laughs> these days I can go through uh, somebody very close to me, um, a, a, a lady in my life, um, she passed away. I didn't, do you know, this, I, 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 can I say this now? Um, we were having, we were having lunch one day and um, we knew that her life expectancy wasn't massive because of uh, an illness that she had. And we were talking about if she passed away, would, um, would I drink? And she said, I'll tell you two things. So I said, go on. She said, the first thing is I'd haunt you if you drank. And she said, yes, yeah, she said, and the second thing is, we were laughing when she said it. She said, seriously, the second thing is, she said, you know, when you get a pint of really cold beer, a nice cold lager, and the glass has got all the, the mist on the outside, and as the runs go down the glass, you can just see it. She said, think of them as my tears if you decide to pick a drink up. Ooh, that's oh, good. Yeah. So, you know, not that I ever that's had That's a really good guilt trip. Strong work. That's amazing. But yeah, and I and I and I sort of tell at an AA meetings and see people go, ooh, because it, it is there. I mean, I've never been in a situation where that's something I've thought about. Right. But that but I, I know damn well that if I was stood at a bar with a pint in front of me, that would be in my head. It's impactful. That would be yeah. in my head. So, you know, she's left me, but she's she's left me with a, a positive um thought that if I ever do, I'm gonna get haunted. And there, her tears on the glass. But uh, yeah, but I mean, going back to that day, um, as I said, it 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 wasn't. It was like it wasn't me that made the decision. If that makes sense, it was just this something within me just said, "I'm done. I can't do this anymore." And, and as I said, I, I ran to the the treatment centre. I did everything, and and I, I you know, two people, lots and lots of people helped me. 
But two people, our two children, who in their different ways were immense. Um, you know, my daughter with my grandsons, and she sort of had to look after that. Well, my second grandson wasn't born. Um, my sobriety date and his birthday are very, very close. And my younger grandson, my elder grandson, sorry, has never, can't remember me drinking. Um, but she, she sort of, once I got myself into treatment and started to get well, I mean, she traveled sort of three and a half hours to drive and come and see me and bring the boys and then took part in a, in a counseling session with me with a one, with just her and I and a superb counselor at Clouds. And then when I was leaving, my son came and picked me up and he, I didn't want to go back to my apartment. I was terrified of going back into that environment where I'd sort of have my last drink. And he took me to his home. Um, he gave me a bed, I said a sofa as it was at that time. Um, and on, that was on the Friday. And on the, on the Monday morning, he took me to work with him. And, and he put, so he put food in my stomach. He gave me a roof over my head and he gave me work. Nice. And, and then short, shortly afterwards, you know, um, he, he, he just supported me in so many ways. My daughter was there to, to sort of help me through. And no one was sort of knocking on the door, trying to smell my breath or anything like that. They just guided me through. It was almost like they were there with a the safe pair of hands in case of I was falling one way or the other, but they weren't grabbing me and holding me. And it was such a loving way for them to do it. And the trauma that they would have gone through to see their dad in that way. Mm -hmm. just, and, and so, you know, well, you mentioned work. Can we circle back to that real quick? Because so I worked through all of this, like, like uh, I was actually pretty functional. I started two businesses, like, and that's where it gets really tricky is like, you have a problem. And, like, I just think, well, what could I have done? Like how, if I hadn't been drinking, cause I spent three decades, wasted three decades, you know, of my life yeah. you know, where I could have been living my best life. And I was always three steps forward, two steps back, you know, like, no, it wasn't traumatic but it was definitely like it, it held me back so mm -hmm. with you and your level of drinking how did you work well the first thing is in um the end of 92 the start of 93 i gave up a 20-year career because i knew i couldn't give up drinking oh, um no. and so and then I decided that if I didn't have a job, if I didn't have this job, I was a mid-ranking police officer. If I didn't have that job, I wouldn't have the pressure. So I would then be able to focus on getting sober. Wrong. Absolutely wrong. It you just meant... You have time to drink. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, um, and that's, that's what happens over a period of time. Um, and my, my, my whole past from, say, 93 right the way up to 2011 is um roy stopping drinking getting a really good job and then sort of a year into it 18 months into it six weeks into it whatever the time scale was walking away from it because um i picked up a drink and i can't function with drink so the crazy situation was used to be working in the city of london and i used to get the train and i'd, I'd have i'd have a suit on and i'd have a briefcase and the briefcase was just deep enough to have four cans of cider in it. And I knew where to stand on the platform so that when the train came in, I was by the bathroom. So it was only a half hour journey. And then I would have these four tins of drink in that half hour. And then I would get off the other end. And then the fear hit me, how am I gonna get the smell off my breath? And I would then spend the entire day trying to avoid people in case somebody smelled it on my breath. And it was the most, exhausting way to it try exhausting. Live. it does yes and i knew pe the people around me were happy with what i was doing but i knew i was operating on two out of six cylinders you and, weren't and being just, authentic either so like it's hard to live that way when you're not living in integrity you can't you're not i mean you you have you know that we're only sick as our secrets you ever hear that phrase like oh yeah yeah, yeah. so you know you had big secrets like every day you were hiding so and isn't life so much better so much more liberating when you're able to just you know be yeah. yourself yeah. and trust yourself <laughs> yeah. when when my phone goes and it might be my my son or my daughter saying you know oh 
where, where are you tonight? And I don't sort of, I can just sort of say, oh, I'm at home or I'm in a meeting or I'm out with some friends or what have you. Not trying to get away from the noise of the bar and try and tell them I'm somewhere else or what have you. Yeah. And, it, and it, was, it was futile because they knew exactly where I was. The reason they were ringing and asking the question was they were just waiting for me to start lying because they knew that's what I was going to do. And it must have been awful for them. But yeah. today, I, I'll tell them exactly where I am and what I'm doing because I, there are no secrets. I'm not sick. And, and, and because the, you're not truly a liar. It was the alcohol. It was, it's, you yeah. weren't being, you, you're your authentic self now. You were living a lie then. And now you're living your truth. Absolutely. And do you know what? The one person I lied to the most was me. Yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's no lies so great as the lies we tell ourselves. And, and the biggest lie I told myself was, you know, tomorrow morning, that's it. I won't drink tomorrow. And of course, tomorrow came the shakes, the the anxiety, the withdrawal. I was going to have a drink because I'll stop. I'll stop tomorrow. Definitely tomorrow will be the day. And tomorrow comes. And of course, that's the old phrase: and tomorrow never comes. Right. Tomorrow right. never ever comes. And that and shame, so, yeah. shame and guilt is just the, the worst. It's just the yeah. worst. Yeah. But you know, and I think the the if, if I wanted to give any message today, is that there is so much help out there, and and. We, and I say we, and I, I class myself as an alcoholic, have to make that decision for us. Right. Not, not for our families, not for our employers, not for our doctors. We have to make that decision for ourselves. And if it's for us, because let's be honest, most alcoholics are pretty damn selfish people. So if we do it for ourselves, we're far more likely to carry it through. If I do it for somebody else, I'm going to start getting a bit resentful. When it I really has to be one hundred percent commitment because, like I said earlier, if when I was doing the ninety nine percent, like I leave that one percent window open for that, you can't have one percent window open. It's a personal no. change. I had to tell myself no when I'm at a restaurant. Restaurants were my trigger. Being at a restaurant, I want to order a glass of wine. You know, and I'm, you know, you're not that person anymore. You know, I had to tell myself, you are not the person who orders. What? No, it's like not an option. Take the option off the table. It's no longer yeah. an option. Don't even no. entertain it for a second. That's what you have to do. So you know, the one thing I wanted to mention here as well, you've just sort of triggered it, is people say to me, why don't you drink alcohol-free wine, alcohol-free beer, alcohol-free spirits when you go, I think we said, what's the point? It's going through the motions. Yeah. Pretty soon, I'm going to go, do you know what? I'm, I'll, I'll have a proper one. Yeah, I'll just have one. Mm -hmm. And of course, and it starts again. It's right. Just, yeah. And, and You're being the, smart. Just don't even go there. No. Well, you know, and, and, and so, so this is it. It's abstinence. And then the life starts because alcohol is a very, very small part of most people's lives. And, and it, so the fact that it doesn't exist in my, no one has ever said to me, employers, clients, when I work, because I've got my, my own business and my own consultancy, no client has ever said to me, do you know what? I don't want you to work for me. I, I, I don't trust people who don't drink. No one has ever right. said that. Right. No one. Um, in fact, some people go, how, how do you, you may have found it yourself. When people find out you don't drink, they'll share with you a little bit of their story and say, do you think I'm an alcoholic? Lots of people want to know. Lots of people have got questions yes. and they start to ask. And, and it's sort of, sober curious. They're sober curious. They're like, yeah. they've been kind of questioning. They're not sure. You know, they have days where they're kind of like, maybe this isn't working for me anymore. And that's who I think like some of my clients, you know, addiction recovery is one of the things that I do. And usually I'm not so much with the active addict, you know, um, so much like your severity it'd be more like the sober curious people who are just realizing you know <laughs> maybe it's yeah. time to give this up you know it's, it's just taking me backwards and i'm stuck in life because it's always like i said earlier three steps forward two steps back and you're just never really or two steps forward three steps back i don't know it was yeah, different, different I, 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 know, I know what you mean but you know what when people say to me do you think i'm an alcoholic I would never ever judge and say, yes, I do, or no, I don't. I might have an idea in my head as to what I think, but I'm not going to verbalize it. But um, somebody once said to me, you know, if your drinks cost you anything more than money, you might want to ask yourself some questions. Yeah. And, and well, I mean, if, it, if you don't have control, if you um, it's if it's affecting your life negatively, 
And I think it's something only the person can answer for themselves because I think let's be honest, even a normal drinker is going to have a bad night. Even a normal drinker is going to like overdo it one night at New Year's Eve or a party. And, and that's not who we're talking about, right? Like Mm -hmm. we're not saying no one can drink alcohol is evil. Some people can drink normally. Um, and there is something, there's an opiate blocker. Naltrexone. Have you heard of naltrexone? No, don't think I have. You're going to want to, um, you're going to want to look into this just for people that might actually need it. Obviously you don't anymore, but there's a difference. Like people who get addicted to alcohol, our brains truly react differently to alcohol. So we get more pleasure. So there now trexones and opiate blockers also used, um, to help people with, um, uh, food addiction. So some people would take it 30 minutes before they would eat and they wouldn't eat as much because they're not deriving as much pleasure. So right. it's a lot of addiction, um, I would go so far as to say it's a little bit compulsive, a little bit OCD like behaviors. A lot of people who have a problem drinking also have a problem with binging somehow with food. You know, there's a connection there in the brain and that's why naltrexone is used. It's very cheap. But um, at one point I ordered it along with a couple of my friends who we all had, you know, cause it's hard to tell when you have a problem when all your friends drink the same yeah. or even more. And then you're like, oh, I'm good. I'm good. We're all, we're all doing it. Um, but we were all three questioning ourselves at this point in time. We ordered it from, um, I think it ended up coming from India. So it took a long time. We we're all excited to get it. And we take this one pill. There's even a documentary, one little pill. And I, you know, I'm, I'm going to put all of this stuff in the link app on the video, including Roy's contact information. I will put that in there because this is important information for people. It has helped um, for people who just can't, they don't want to let go of drinking. This pill could t- save their life because I've taken it. It's actually one of the main reasons I quit drinking is because I took this pill 30 minutes. It's either 30 minutes or an hour before I started, before your first drink. And what it does is it takes that pleasure away. It's an opiate blocker. I did. It makes you not give a shit about alcohol. It, t- it turned you, your brain into a normal drinker. So you're drinking it, you feel the effects, but it's not as fun. And you're like, oh, is this how normal drinkers feel? Like this is kind of, eh, meh. It's, it's, it's not even, and that's the difference between people who get really addicted. They don't They don't get so much pleasure from that. They don't get as much as someone who has that addictive and the same with food. So that's why that naltrexone, N-A-L-T-R-E-X-O-N-E, I believe. Um, And they, we have a problem in the United States where it's really hard to get stuff cheap. It's a very cheap pill, but you can't get a prescription here. You know, like it's, it's, you got to go through a lot of stuff, but so that's why we ordered it from a pharmacy, like in, out of Canada, but we ended up shipping from India and we all got it. We all took it. And, um, what it's supposed to do is you don't want you, you'll have one or two drinks and you're like really done because you don't, it's not even that great anymore. It took the pleasure away that big, you know, uh, there's a word that I can't think of right now. Euphoric. I'm going to take your word from earlier. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, absolutely. that you get is not there. It's just okay. You're just like, okay. And that's like, wow, this is how people, you know, who can just put down, that's how they do it. People who leave like their drink on the table, like what the hell? I was always so confused. Like, how do they do that? Well, that's because they're not getting that huge reward that we're, that we were getting there. They don't get that. So um, I think her name's Claudia. And I, like I said, I'm going to put this underneath the video later, but she has a documentary about this and she still drinks, but she takes one of those pills every time before she drinks. So she was severe, um, your level. Uh, and she ended up in the hospital on all that. She, she spent tens and tens and tens of thousands of dollars. She's actually a celebrity. A lot of people will know who she is. And I, I think her name might come to me during this video, but um, on rehabs, expensive ones out in, you know, Beverly Hills and all this stuff and nothing worked, nothing worked. And, and it's, and then she found naltrexone and it's the only thing and she still will drink and she'll just take a pill every time before and it saves lives. And there's a method that it's called and, and, and go ahead and talk Roy while I'm looking that up. So, so you haven't heard of that at all. You're telling me? No, no. I mean, that, that kind of thing I mean, for, for me, um, I, I would have, whilst I was out there, I would have loved to have found something like that. 
it's where happy. I am now. Fight it because um, the th the thought now of saying okay, there's a pill I can take and I'll be able to have two or three drinks terrifies me. From where from where I've been to where I am now. I mean, there's all with the with all. Oh, I don't this. recommend that. I recommend no, no, just no, no. yeah. You've got to say, yeah. It, for, for me, you know, it would be. And what if it didn't work? What if and and the thought of having to go anywhere near where I was because the the one the problem I would have is that I I think if I pick up a drink, it's more than likely going to kill me. Yeah, that's yeah. where I'm at. And that's you would probably that's, not take the pill. So you'd be like, no, I don't have the pleasure. So next time I'm not going to take that pill. But that's what I was saying is it took away what it did to me is it revealed that it's not the alcohol that's so powerful. It was my brain causing that huge reward that, you know, that released all the endorphins or whatever, yeah, you know, I don't know and and all, the, um, <laughs> all the things. And yeah. it, the, suddenly the alcohol just lost its, you know shine to me i was like whatever this is just whatever because all i had to do was take an opiate blocker and it was meh but it, her name is um claudia christian and the documentary is one little pill and then she also did a ted talk um she did a really good ted talk that i saw and she talks about how the same thing how uh th this pill t saved her life from uh how i saved myself from from alcohol. So I'm about to pull that up. It is called How I Overcame Alcoholism, Claudia Christian. Um, so she, you might recognize her. I recognized her face for sure. She's been in a few things. And um, it's called the Sinclair Method, the Sin Sinclair Method, S-I-N-C-L-A-I-R. Um, and she just kind of, it's it's been out there and she brought it out uh, into the public and did a TED Talk. It's fantastic. One of my friends actually found it and sent it to me. And then we went on that little journey together. And like I said, it just took away the appeal for me. It was so helpful, but in a very different way than I thought it would. I thought at that time, this is a way I can keep alcohol in my life and moderate. But it made it, I didn't even want to drink if I wasn't getting that pleasure. Yeah. Right? I, if, if you take away that euphoria, that hit, that... Good point. Um, calming effect as you say you may as, so so you, you you you're paying not a fortune but you're paying quite a bit of money for something which is a little more than a soft drink to you so why would you and yeah. i can, I can, I can, you, I can see you that. still feel so i don't want to say you didn't get a buzz because you'd still feel but it just was like 15 20 percent of the you know mm -hmm. you, the, no, the, I, the goodness <laughs> yeah goodness. Uh, you know but, what i mean uh, yeah, I mean, I, I sort of, um, you see quite a few people um, sort of seeking hypnotherapy around um, alcoholism at the moment. And um, when you start to talk to people, the, 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 the whole variety of reasons that people have for drinking, there's not one common reason. Um, you know, it's gone up since COVID, since the pandemic, like, you okay. know, I know a lot of people weren't able to get to AA, you know, they weren't able to, I mean, you know, that it, that couldn't have been good you know a lot of people well, reported th there was a massive there was an explosion of zoom meetings the reality because yeah. here we have people joining from the states people from here joining and the, it gave people an opportunity suddenly to dip into meetings all around the world that were previously not accessible to them oh. and so in a, in a sense we we're able to meet people on online and not that we met through a, an aa meeting or anything but certainly um, during COVID and all the Zoom meetings, yeah. it certainly brought the, the fellowship to, to be um, international it, in a sense that you yeah, could that go awesome. anywhere and not, get, and not get out your chair. Yeah, that's great. Well, I thought that people were, and you know, I'm sure it's different for different places, and, and but I heard that people were really drinking again because they were freaking out and not able to go that you know i guess certain people would need to be in person you know zoom yeah. wasn't enough of a connection and they resorted to just going you know backsliding essentially oh, yeah th th there was a lot of that um a lot of people were, were picking up um because you know you've got people who've got a problem with alcohol and then take them into the situation that covid brought where mm -hmm. we had you know fears of employment fears of homelessness fears of illness, 
the loss generalized of anxiety and then we're picking up uh, on the collective anxiety too you know there's a collective consciousness and we're tapping in we're feeling all of that energy is out there and yeah. we're, we're soaking all that in it was you know it's still it's still not gone we're we're going to have ptsd from the pandemic for a while you know oh i, I think so for, for quite some time um but you know it's it's sort of um people in isolation as well um mm -hmm. working from home and, and now that as, as a concept seems to be a great thing to do but you need that there's something about going into an office going into a workplace and meeting connection. with other people having that connection having that support it's not the same just having a, a zoom or a teams call that face to face is we didn't realize i think how important that was until we didn't have it isn't it so, so true you know you don't know what you've got till it's gone absolutely and, yeah, I can tell stories when I don't know the origin, but I do. I'm going to just say maybe you've. <laughs> I'm going to do it anyway. So there's a there's a um, a, like there was a study done, a scientific thing with rats, and it's always sad to me because I don't like that you know they take the hit, but it's what happened. So they they were studying like they were giving rats cocaine. I believe it was cocaine, mm -hmm. and they would have. So, you know, they would hit this thing and, you know, they get it, hit it again, hit it again. Well, once it, when they were in isolation, they were just kept wanting more and more and more and more. When they brought a community and they they brought other rats in with this rat, instead of it being isolated, they quit hitting the thing to get the cocaine, to get the reward. Yeah. They stopped. Yeah. So it was all about connection versus isolation. So it had to be horrible for people who even like some people might have just started their journey, like assume they, oh, I'm going to quit drinking. And then we <laughs> pandemic, you know, and that would be really bad timing. <laughs> and, and the other thing, you know, you supermarkets and the, the, the large stores were still open and you could see um, people shopping. Um, the, the tops of the trolleys were getting bigger and bigger and bigger with cases of booze and sort of those colossal amounts of booze coming out of supermarkets because people were home, there was nothing else to do. That was our yeah, default. Here too. Yeah. Liquor yeah. store didn't shut down here. We had essential things, essentials. It was one of the essentials we kept open here. <laughs> yeah. Ice cream, um, ice cream uh, like, I, I thought that was an odd one, but ice cream turned out to be essential uh, uh, in my neighborhood, at least. <laughs> it's, it's amazing, isn't it, what, what, what people find to be essential at yeah. times of crisis. Okay. But you know, one of the other things I thought about coming out of this was the sense of community particularly during the first year um we we had all kinds of things going. one of the lovely things that used to happen here um you talking about it, the first year of the pandemic or the first yes. year that you were sober okay first, first year of the pandemic was gotcha. just the, the camaraderie where people were coming together were looking for ways to support the vulnerable the yeah. elderly and we they used to have this thing at eight o'clock at night where people used to go to the door and applaud for the nhs thanking the emergency services and particularly the frontline workers, the doctors and the nurses in yeah. the NHS. And, and it's sort of not so much the second time around, but certainly the first time. It yeah. really brought that the spirit of- that were heroes, we, we, you know, they were suddenly no longer, oh, the truck drivers, oh, you know, the people in the supermarkets, you know, and, you know, it's, it's different, you know, now it's like the same, it, same people, healthcare workers, you know, they're, they were made to work through all of that hell, through the pandemic, understaffed, too many hours more than humanly possible. And then what happens, you know, that, that was what, before the vaccine, the va if, oh, if you don't get vaccine, you're fired. Not, you know, suddenly you're. Oh, uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, you, you know, it's kind of like the way it reminds me of one of the, uh, you know, a manipulation, like a abusive relationship where, you know, you, they hold you up on a pedestal and, and, and all this stuff, find out all your vulnerabilities, make you, you know, you're a hero. You're so the best. You're the best thing I ever met. I mean, look, and then just to knock you down later, you know, um, the a manipulation tactic. And it's kind of, feel mm. like that's what happened to uh, healthcare workers a little bit to me, but we won't get on that subject. But no, anyway. no, no, that's, but I, I know exactly what you, what you mm -hmm. say. Um, so, yeah, I mean, sort of, you know, not that COVID has actually gone away, but it's certainly, um, hugely diminished from where we were. Right. And I think, as you say, there are lots of people who are coming out of it and finding that there are um, issues that they have that they're now thinking about how they can get treatment for it. And of course, for a lot of this stuff, 
it doesn't sit within the mainstream um, healthcare provision that we get in this country. So people are now sort of looking for other alternatives. And I think maybe um, the solution focused hypnotherapy is one of many. I'm not saying it's the only. No, I know I got more clients than ever during the pandemic. And why? It's because people were forced to sit home, take inventory of their life, be introspective. And, and they're like, hey, I need to change some stuff around. It was a wake up call. And then how often do we just sit still like that? How often do we have, you know, all that free time on our hands? You know, like it, we were forced to be in the present moment for the, you know, Mm. for the first time in a lot of our lives, you know? And then, you know, I think that was probably a really good thing that came out of it, you know? Mm. You know just, but what, just, what a lot of people tended to do was look at worst case scenario. When yeah. you sat at home on your own, start to think about all the things that could go wrong. You know, you might've had a letter that morning that wasn't particularly pleasant from the bank or from wherever it might be. Mm-hmm. And then suddenly it's a letter that you can deal with but what people maybe avoid making the phone call and then start to think about the consequences. This might happen, that might happen. And none of the situations they envisaged were pleasant. They always had a really negative um, outcome with it. And, and as, with, with, with solution-focused hypnotherapy, as I say, there are many different types of hypnotherapy. Mm-hmm. We, when somebody comes in, we want to know what is it that's brought you here today? And we'll explore that a little bit. But the focus is really on what you want to get out of it. Where would you like to be? What do you want to do? And and it's this, that's why we call it solution focused. Well, they have to have clarity. How do you work on, how do you help someone when they don't even have clarity of of what they're looking for? And and that's it. So once you know what it is they're looking for and you explore that a little bit, you can then start through, through a process of, of we have this thing called the miracle question that we work through we have scaling um and we have trance and and trance is a lovely um lovely way for people to well certainly through trance to make contact with the subconscious mind and it's a lot of people think when they go to see a hypnotherapist that we're going to have them running around doing chicken impressions or believing their backsides on fire or whatever yeah. but it, it is just like it's a, a, a light meditative state yeah. and people are conscious of what's going on around them in the main. Um, they're never touched or anything like that. It's they're just relaxed and they're listening to the therapist with some uh, background music, just going through scripts and language patterns that are appropriate to them and their particular issues. Mm-hmm. And it's amazing sort of just at the end of one session when people have gone through that, just how relaxed they feel. And with solution yeah, one of my friends, you know, and she said that, yeah, she was, she was really surprised about, you know, like, I guess vision start coming. I've never done it personally, but yeah, she said that how relaxed she was and she started getting vi- visions, visuals. So like, so let's go over this again. Anxi- anyone who's suffering from anxiety or depression, some sort of trauma. Um, and by the yeah. way, trauma is something different for everybody. It could be something big, but it could also be something small because it's, we can't compare traumas because it is the meaning we attach to it. I could go through the same exact thing Roy went through and maybe it affected him in a completely different way. Like, it could, like no big deal to me. And it like really had a huge effect yeah, on his absolutely. life. And so we can't say, well, you know, I was fine when that happened because everybody's different. Everybody's going to respond differently. And then I might respond to something else might f- trigger me. That's not going to trigger you. It's just, we can't, we can't compare. And, and of course, w- one of the things which came out during um, the pandemic, which is huge now, people dealing with grief, dealing with bereavement, which is a big part of it. Um, we've already I mean, mentioned. My, my first tell me your story was a, a, about grief. Yeah. So, so, sorry, was that? My first um, video of the series, or my second, oh, was grief and trauma, um, dealing with loss. Um, the, yeah. yeah. And, and so, um, and, you, and you mentioned people with phobias as well. Phobias seem to have come to the fore. Smoking, weight loss. Yeah, um, pain management. Pain um, management. Yeah, I mean, it goes right the way across the board. There are solution-focused hypnotherapists who deal with um, um, childbirth, um, who are not, not not obviously delivering children, but calming oh, people down, relaxation <laughs> around childbirth, around fertility issues. There's so many different things. What about uh, fears? Like like if they have a fear, yeah. 
Um, well, fear, stroke, phobias. I mean, we can. You, we can oh yeah, deal, we, phobias, we, we've got. There's a particular method that we use to deal with very, very specific phobias, like spiders and rats and those kinds of things. But then oh. people may say, "I've got a fear of heights." Well, what kind of heights is it being on a plane? Is it up a ladder? Is it on a mountain? So that's far less specific. So we have a different way of dealing with that. So it depends upon what the phobia or the fear is. Phobias tend to be very specific, whereas the fears are far more generalized. Yeah. So what about a generalized fear like that? Like what if someone just has like, let's say they're afraid to date, they have social anxiety, they quit drinking, and then they want to there's a girl that, that this guy likes and he's afraid to ask her out because, you know, are you able to help that guy? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when people get um, anxiety, anxious, should I say, and fearful, they're operating in their primitive brain. Yeah. Yeah, the amygdala is taken over. And, and it goes back to the, you know, the caveman, the fight, the flight, the freeze. And, and our brain is it, sort of, not say it's not evolved, but it still goes to that basic primal instinct mm -hmm. and what we do through with solution focused hypnotherapy is to take them back up into their intellectual mind where they can make rational decisions based on a proper assessment of what's going on everybody we talk about people have got this uh, metaphorical stress bucket and through so, and, and when this stress bucket gets full it really interrupts sleep REM sleep is meant to empty the stress bucket to clear the brain of stress and anxiety but for people who are heavily stressed, this stress bucket doesn't get yeah, empty. Yeah, and, and, and most people have go thousands and thousands of negative thoughts every day. And very, very, very few of them will ever come to fruition. But nonetheless, the negative thoughts get stored in this, this stress bucket. And, and so, they're repetitive. They're the same ones from the day before. From the, and that's why people don't make change, because they have yeah. the same repetitive isn't it like 90, 95% of our thoughts from the day before are repetitive and 80 to 85% of those are negative? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. And, 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 and that's absolutely true. And of course, when we are in the primitive brain, everything is negative. Everything is negative. And so, you know, it goes back to this, this caveman. There's a very good book called Cavemen and Polar Bears really go into depth in this but this fight flight freeze response mm -hmm. it, it kicks in an envelope comes through the letterbox in the morning it kicks in when the phone goes and we don't want to talk to the person automatically we go into this primitive brain and what we're doing with solution focused hypnotherapy is keeping people in their intellectual brain so they can rationalize it um so people who don't know what you're saying those um fight flight triggered like it's triggered like it keeps you it helps you with your triggers triggers are anytime you're triggered by something that's an area where it's telling you it's a blessing look at it in this way that's an area where you need some work you you need healing so yes. when you feel that you're triggered don't you know it's okay it's it's, it's a blessing it's a, it's to know it, all feelings are okay because let's use them as guidance let's not label them bad let's not feel bad let's not beat ourselves up for having negative feelings use them as guidance in which direction and what step you're going to take next yeah and, and See so a coach you know so work with your mindset because we have to make your and i just did a subconscious mind meme this morning so it's fresh on my brain i don't know if you saw it but it was all about subconscious mind versus conscious mind, but our subconscious mind um, takes everything literally. So you got to be careful what you say. Yeah. Its main purpose is to keep us alive, right? It's like yeah. we, we will keep you alive, and um, you you got to you. That's one of the reasons you got to be really careful of your thoughts. And the way to heal yourself is to someone like Roy, you make those subconscious thoughts conscious bring the things that you're not aware of into awareness so that you're able to heal them and that you are no longer triggered um you no longer have those responses of fight flight freeze and isn't there fawn isn't fawn one of them fight fawn i don't know of that one but certainly fight fight freeze <laughs> No, 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 maybe you're right. Maybe it's me that's wrong. But yeah, but the, ba basic, the basic premise there is that we are conditioned by our whole history, all our ancestors. That's the way we've developed. And as you say, getting up into the intellectual mind yeah. and making those conscious decisions based on a proper assessment of the situation rather than based on 
all the times it happened before. Yeah. It was a disaster then, so it's going to be a disaster again. It doesn't need to be. We deal with these situations. Like with yeah. relationships, like you could be like, everything's fine. And, you know, like there's no big deal, but someone that you're in a new relationship, they could say something that reminds you of something someone in your past did. And then you're suddenly freaking out on them and you don't even know why. And there's a reason you don't know why, because it's your subconscious mind. You're not logical in the moment. You are not even able to reach your conscious mind when you're in that state. Um when you're, when you're triggered, we'll just call it triggered right. and put it all together. And you, you can't even think logically. And that's why you see perfectly, you know, like mature adults can like go backwards into this childlike oh. primitive yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. out of the blue. And you're like, where is this coming from, man? And it's not, it's not even about you. It's about their past. Yeah. So as you say, something's triggered off a feeling from the past and they brought that feeling from the past right into the present relationship so therefore this and they one can't see it in the moment happening. they don't see it in the moment because they're not in their logical thinking mind they're not mm -hmm. there so good luck trying to convince them they can't hear you <laughs> <laughs> literally not in that moment they maybe later when they're out of the trigger mode yeah and, and um you know with with the solution focus there's, there's a um, high degree of success and and i think a lot of people like it because we don't dwell um, by by raking up the past, going over and over and over, what was it like and what happened? We just sort of we need to understand, but then move on. And and sort of the analogy I use is there's a reason why the rearview mirror in the car is very much smaller than the front windscreen because the front windscreen is where most of our attention goes. We have a little bit of a look every now and then, but the front windscreen is where we need to be and looking out into the future. And my coaching is the same way. And actually coaching should be that way. You shouldn't be focusing on the past. You should be, okay, yes, we got to talk about the past a little bit, right? We got to like yeah. figure out like, you know, what your goal figure out. But, but it's not about telling a victim story. It's not about going over and over and over the things that went wrong. That's not how you heal. The way you heal is, you know, we, we do need to figure out how you got to where you are, but we got to focus on the present. What are we going to do next? What are the next steps? Don't stay in that old vibration. That's when you have people get stuck. They, they kind of create a yeah. dead. I, I think people um, start to like their identity, even when it is negative. They, that's who they are. They don't know what to do without that victim role because they've always been a victim. And instead of being a hero, like, like the hero's journey. And I kind of want you to bring that up a little bit about the Joseph Campbell heroes. Is it Joseph? Oh, Joseph yeah. Campbell, right. Was he the um, Joseph Campbell? Joseph, isn't he the one? Isn't it, is it Joseph Campbell? Am I wrong? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I came across him when, when I was doing some coaching training. Yeah. And um, we, we were the particular module of the course. We were talking about metaphors. And of course, Joseph Campbell, the, this, this, this film, The Hero's Journey, is all about Joseph Campbell. Um, and there are some really, really um, famous celebrities on there. Who I watched are, it because you told me to watch it. And I oh, had what an amazing it, yes. film. And, and, and the, so, it's a powerful, powerful um, piece of filmmaking. Um, but it is, it's all about the hero's journey. And I love the bit about if you are approaching, um, if you're going into a forest and there are pathways into the forest through the snow, we don't follow one of those. We follow our own because it's our own hero's journey. We're not yeah. following somebody else's. Well, Joseph Locke, Joseph Locke, no, sorry, Joseph Campbell um, encourages us to find our own path. Path, he's a, he's a follow path. your bliss. He's the guy who said follow your bliss, right? That's exactly the one. Follow yeah. your bliss because it's your bliss. It's your journey. It's your story. And when Pete, I, I don't know how you found it, but when I watched that film, you told I me found, about it. Yeah, I know. So, so when I say I don't know how you found it, when what how you found watching it, what you you sort of got out of. Oh, it. found it. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Um, when I found it, I found myself really sort of empowered. To, to do things and, and sort of, I can do this. And I just found, when, when the film finished, I just sort of sat back in my chair and thought, wow, I was absolutely blown away by it. There's such power in that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's really what sort of um, took me on the journey forward and then sort of into hypnotherapy because there's a, there's a lovely link, I think, between life coaching and, and hypnotherapy, NLP. Um, I mean, for me, my, my journey is taking me now to start to look at other therapies and how I can offer a, a tool chest 
of therapies for people. You know, right. hypnotherapy will will support and complement them all. But where do I go? What can I what can I give this person that will enhance the basic hypnotherapy? What can I do with them that will make them feel better? Give them strategies. Um, one thing I don't do is tell people what you must do. Right, because it has to be something. They're not going to stick with anything that doesn't that doesn't resonate with them. I mean, no. they, they're, oh, not, they're not. It. it has to feel good to them. You you got to replace addiction with something. You know, um, sometimes it's another addiction, but it's okay if it's a healthier. Like I went to the gym a lot. Like I started just going to the gym. Do the times that I would like want to go to the. You know, I wasn't like hanging out at bars. I would go to a restaurant. It seemed all innocent. You just have wine every night and then end up, you know, hungover. So I started going to the gym during, you know, find something to do in place of it. And so that you're not falling back into those old patterns, but it's got to be yeah. something you like, so you don't backslide. Mm -hmm. But even with the, with the, within the hypnotherapy session, the, the information comes from the client and not from the therapist. The therapist isn't saying, right, what you need to do is we'll sort of be saying to people, we, we talk about the miracle question about where on a scale of one to 10, where are you today? And they will sort of tell, give us a number. And we'll say things like, you know, well, what small thing could you see yourself doing to take you up to the next level? And, and, and what would that be like? What would your family notice? What would you? And we start to talk about people about- And this is when you know, they're in the trance, right? You're asking- No, 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 this is before you get to the trance. Oh, this is before, yeah, okay. We, do, we, don't, we don't, there's no direct suggestion in trance. Trance is just a, a language pattern where they literally just close their eyes, lay back and just go into this like meditative okay. state and the words just flow over them. But before we get there, it's all the, the positives that are coming from them. What could you see yourself doing? What small thing? And sometimes the increments, the improvements you make will be very, very small. And yet other times they'll be, they'll be quite big. But we want people to think about what's been good in their lives that week. What are they looking forward to? What are they proud of? And just keep the positives because the positives, they give us that feel good factor. When we realize the different things that we can actually do to make ourselves better, and the therapist is reinforcing it by asking them, you know, and um, what would if 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 that happened in your life, what would that give you? And you can sort of chunk it up and make it bigger, make it brighter, and people get that real feel good. And then mm -hmm. then you can go into the trance, and that sort of reinforces it. Right. And what we also do is we get people preparation before the trance. And, and and real quick, just to insert there because you brought up a really good point. Everybody, you know, like a hypnotherapist, a life coach, we're guiding people are self healers. Everyone ultimately yeah. heals themselves. Our role is to guide you into something that, you know, sometimes we just, people have blocks, you know, and they can't see, it's really hard to see your own stuff. <laughs> stuff. Yeah, definitely. And so that's the purpose is guidance, but ultimately it's, it's, you're working together. It's not like the coach is healing you. The coach is guiding you to heal yourself. The hypnotherapist is guiding you to tap into what, you, you know, you are a genius. You, your higher self is in there. You know, we're just bringing it out of you. And that's right. And just, you know, as you said, the, the coach, the therapist, um, the NLP practitioner, there's loads and loads of stuff out there. Right. Um, people talk about is it EFT, the tapping. There's so yeah. many different therapies out there that can help people. Um, um, and, you know, but it's all based around how are they, they, they make the decisions about mm -hmm. what they're going to do. Yeah. Um, we, we will sort of guide and we will encourage and we'll nurture. But at the end of the day, if they make the undertaking to do certain things, they're far more likely to do it. Then if I say, right, by next week, I want you to have done A, B, C, D, out the door and, you know, that, that's not going to happen. But if they make that undertaking. Now, the other thing we do is we will give them a recording of the trance to listen to each oh, night. That's cool. So it enforces the trance every night you listen to it. And it, you, you, it helps with this bucket emptying while you sleep. When you go into REM sleep, you're listening to that recording at least once a day. And it really does make a significant difference. Very cool. Very cool. So, um, Roy, did we cover the part, everything that you wanted to talk about surrounding your addiction? Because I did have a question. I wanted to ask if, if is it okay to go yeah, there? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. I don't want to interrupt you if you were not finished with the thought. No, no, no. Okay. 
So what would you say if you could pick one thing that helped you the most to that um, got you like, or that continues to help you? Cause we know a, a, a di- recovery for addictions an ongoing journey, you know, we're, which is something that we work on every day. We don't want to like ever be like, I'm good. So what do you think continues that helped the most and continues to help the most to, to stay sober? Okay. And I think I know what your answer is, but, but I want to see. And if, if you can't, well, you for me, it it, it's, it, what, the one word is gratitude. Yes, that's perfect. Yeah. I, um, I wasn't thinking of that one. I was thinking of serving others because you keep getting that. Um, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, but, but I mean, it links in, doesn't it? For me, for me on a daily basis it is a gratitude list, but yeah. the, the law of attraction cards, which are absolutely amazing. Um, I Roy uh, bought my Roy bought my addiction uh, uh, addiction recovery with the law of attraction cards, and I I mailed them to the UK, and they were they cost more to ship them there than the cards cost themselves. That was outrageous. Uh, and but, so when we got that, that out, but what an investment! Because um, uh, over the three weeks that I, I've, I've been using them, I, I stay in hotels a lot, so I always have them with me. And it's my ritual in the morning before I get on with the day. Get the cards out and, and I sort of shuffle them, to tap it three times and then shuffle them and just go to one of the cards that resonates. And on a regular basis, serving others comes up, serving gratitude others. comes up and meditation comes up. And that, that seems to be a recurring theme with me. Yeah, um, others crop up the that. Sorry, what did you say? I was going to say other cards pop up occasionally, yeah. but the recurring theme yeah. are those three. Yeah. And out of those three, the most prominent one is serving others. Yeah. And that's what I was going to get to is because I do think that's what pulled me out um, specifically would be when I help other people. And I think that's one of the, the main uh, functions of AA, you know, even though I didn't go to AA, I'm still kind of doing it parallel like when you help other people with your story it helps you it comes it's a, you know it goes full circle right and so yeah, getting out of your own karmic, head karmic isn't it yeah yeah well, also just getting out of your own head if you're helping other people you're not sitting there going oh i need this i need i need a drink i need i need relief because you're not in your own head you're helping other people so it makes it so much easier and i think for me And and for a lot of alcoholics, going through the physical act, whether it be writing it down or whether it be in your head, whether you verbalize it, of a gratitude list. And things, it's not sort of whether you've got an Aston Martin in the driveway or whether you've got a a multi-million pound bank balance, none of that. It's for me, it's the roof over my head. Right. It's my, my family around me. It's friends. It's health. It's sanity. It's um food. Law of Attraction 101, you have to write a, uh, if, if you want things to manifest physically into your life, write a gratitude list. He's 100% right. It's the number one most important thing is being grateful and write. You can, if you're trying to get something, you could write the, of course, things that you already have, but if you want to manifest something, um, write it in such a way. I am so thankful now that I have blank and, and, and yeah, don't, you know, you could talk about abundance, but remember abundance isn't only money and, and, and things it's you can have abundance of love abundance of friendship abundance of connections um there you know just so many things try not to only focus on money like a lot of people i think do that and Mm. uh, that's not what's going to make you happy and the one other thing i would say for me when i'm writing a gratitude list or even doing it in my head i don't just think about it i feel it you know it's this particularly when I'm talking about the love of my family, my friends and things like that. I feel that inside me and and it just gives, and I can feel a smile coming on my lips. And they they do say a grateful alcoholic doesn't relapse. If you're grateful, a grateful alcoholic doesn't relapse. Most of the time um, people relapse, it's because it's poor me. They did this. They said that I should have had this. I didn't get that. Whereas if you if you're if, if you're in the mindset of I'm really grateful for my home, lucky. my family, this I think if we're lucky. Yeah. Like think of how lucky we are because a lot of people don't pull themselves out of this. And you know, I, um, I feel very fortunate that I you know 
had a wake up call or whatever, even though it wasn't like, you know, I, I'm about to write an article uh, for this online publication and it's called rock bottom, not required because you don't have to have a rock bottom just to decide to change your life, lift yourself up and become your own personal hero. And you know, the one thing, if you're doing a gratitude list for me, the first thing that goes on the gratitude list is thank you for a new day because there are about 3 million people each day don't wake up. They went to sleep last night and they, they, they pass away in the sleep. I've been given another day. Hey, Roy. <laughs> but it's true, isn't it? That, that's I know. A very, it's I true. It's a new true. Day. And, and so, I and so a hard time. If, I'm, if I'm going to be given a new day, I'm going to use it to good effect. Amen. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, Roy, is there anything else you'd like to add before we sign off? And I don't think so. It's been an amazing hour or however long we've been. Uh, covered yeah, we so much stuff. I think it's been over an hour. I guess we're going to find out when I edit, edit out the um, the first part where I, I wasn't recording for about 20, 25 minutes and we got to start all over. We did. <laughs> we, you know, it's okay. We had a, we had a practice. We had a practice go. So um, you guys don't forget if you felt like this helped you at all, or if you know someone who it would help, please hit like it. It helps with the algorithms of social media. It helps other people see it. So if you liked it, please hit like, please subscribe to my channel. We are going to do a new, um, you know, Roy will be back, but every week I'm going to have a new tell me your story on Thursdays. So subscribe to my channel, Day One Life Coaching. If you're not watching this from YouTube, it's Day One Life Coaching. And also share, share with your, um, share with anyone who you think would um, love to, you know, schedule something with Roy. Again, it's heroeshypnotherapy.com. Roy Owens, you can also find him on Facebook. He's my Facebook friend. So if you're my Facebook friend, you can, I have my list public, I believe. Go ahead and find him on there, Roy Owens. And um, I guess that's all we have for this round. And I'm sure we'll have you back in the future, Roy. Thank you, Thank you so very, much for volunteering. It's been an absolute pleasure. Be on pleasure. my gratitude list. <laughs> Thank you very much. And you mine. All right, Roy. I, I will talk to you soon. Bye now, Mary. Bye.